town in the United States. It might be yours, following enemy attack with modern weapons. In this city of 600,000, hometown USA, tens of thousands of people surviving, seriously sick and injured, people suffering from burns, broken bones, hemorrhage, shock, and effects of radiation, to say nothing of the everyday confining illnesses. People in need of life-saving surgery and medical care. But what has happened to the city's hospitals, scarcely adequate to take care of the normal needs before the attack? Most hospitals within this aiming area have been destroyed or damaged beyond effective use. The remaining facilities have evacuated those patients who could safely be moved, provided the most effective shelter for those remaining, and are expanding their medical care capabilities to the utmost. By use of halls and other space not normally assigned for patient care, and setting up cots, roll-away beds, and blanket pallets, perhaps several thousand people can be given necessary emergency care. There may be available 5,000 beds, but many times this number of emergency hospital accommodations are needed. What is the answer to this tremendous problem of mass medical care after such a major disaster? The hometown story presents an imaginary but typical case of nuclear disaster in an industrial American city. Now think of the havoc that would develop nationally as a result of weapons of modern warfare hitting hundreds of areas in our country. Our health and medical facilities and supply industry rank with the finest in the world. But war disaster would wipe out a large part of them. Plants manufacturing medicines, medical equipment and supplies would be destroyed or badly damaged. It might be weeks months or longer before they could be put back into production. Within the areas which would probably be targets of an enemy attacking America are many of our key centers of population and industry. With about half of all our people, a majority of our physicians, nurses and allied medical personnel, more than half our general hospital beds, Within these areas, the backbone of our nation's industry are some 2,000 hospitals with about 400,000 general beds. Following disaster, capabilities must be expanded to the fullest. An enemy war plan could bring attack to most of our major centers in an attempt in one sweeping blow to paralyze our industrial might. Result? millions of casualties. Everywhere, staggering destruction, including the widespread effects of fallout. Destruction which could include large numbers of medical and allied medical personnel, as well as their normal sources of health supplies. It is this grave problem to which all government organizations responsible for the care of sick and injured people in time of disaster are giving their attention. Here in sharp focus is the problem. What can be done to provide early hospitalization for the seriously ill and injured as close as possible to the stricken area for life-saving surgery and treatment? Civil defense experts studied with the armed forces and medical and hospital authorities what personnel, equipment, and supplies would be needed. For casualties, Emergency treatment stations for first aid and life-saving surgery on a 24-hour continuing basis. And backing up those stations to serve both the casualties and the sick. Emergency hospitals, able to handle all routine hospital and medical care. In seeking available models for such hospitals, it was found that the 60-bed Mobile Army Surgical Hospital designed to provide superior surgical care for non-transportable battle casualties was the logical model. 
but allowances had to be made for differences in needs and purposes, differences in staffing patterns, in types of cases to be handled, and in the job to be done. After intensive studies came the 200-bed emergency hospital, planned to be set up in a building constructed for another purpose, but a building that lends itself to quick conversion. Let's go back now to hometown USA, to a period before war disaster, and see how this city planned to meet its emergency needs for care of the sick and injured. To select sites for the emergency hospitals hometown needed, local government officials, including medical and hospital representation, in cooperation with communication and traffic experts, made a survey of schools, churches, and other structures. Buildings were selected with no large window areas and preferably basement space in order to provide maximum fallout protection. They planned to provide sandbagged protection on the outside of first floor windows. In choosing sites, realistic principles were applied. Sites chosen outside the probable damage and fallout area, yet close enough to be readily accessible and operable around the clock. Engineering surveys were made of shelter capabilities of existing structures and what improvements could be made to make maximum use of them especially those with basement areas. To provide for disruption of utilities, plans had to be made for auxiliary sources of electricity, gas and water, as well as a means of waste disposal. However, paper planning is not enough. To meet disaster adequately requires that the emergency hospitals in original crates and boxes be on hand stored on or as close to the site as possible. As a result of the hometown survey, storage agreements were completed through the state and local governments with national headquarters. Under the Civil Defense Hospital Prepositioning Program, approval of storage location results in the immediate shipment of a Civil Defense Emergency Hospital to the specified location. Storage in the building outside the target area where the hospital will be set up is ideal if space is available. However, storage of the packaged hospital adjacent to or easily accessible to the site is also acceptable. Under the emergency hospital prepositioning program, the federal government buys, stockpiles, and ships. State and local governments store and maintain those packaged hospitals ready for quick use. Additional hospital units and backup medical supplies are also stored in federal warehouses at key points around the country. When an emergency hospital is set up and put into use, the original supply of medicines, X-ray films, and other expendable items will last a limited time. Stockpiled federal replenishment units contain the essential medical supplies to maintain the hospital in use. Such units will flow out on schedule after each hospital is put into service. And this is the way it would work on the day of disaster, when it is determined that the proposed hospital building is in an area with a safe fallout level for round-the-clock operation. Rooms are cleared within the selected building, in this case a school, as the emergency hospital equipment and supplies are brought up from storage points in the building or nearby. Some 14 tons of equipment are quickly moved into the designated rooms. Within a few hours, the equipment can be set up on a floor area of about 15,000 square feet. Here is a view of the floor plan of this one-time school, now a 200-bed emergency hospital with 20 cots set up in each of 10 classrooms. Various other rooms of the building have been converted to operating rooms, sterilizing room, central supply room, pharmacy, clinical laboratory, kitchen, x-ray room, morgue, 
and offices. By now, personnel begins to arrive to man the emergency hospital. Physicians and dentists, nurses and their aides, administrative people and their helpers. Within an hour after the equipment arrives, some hospital services can begin. One or two doctors, a nurse and helpers are in the foyer to receive casualties. In the foyer, the sick and injured are registered and quickly classified according to their needs for treatment. Meanwhile, immediate life-saving measures are applied where needed. Some casualties, because of burns, injuries, or serious bleeding, are in a state of shock. They are promptly taken to the shock ward. The shock ward is ready with lots of blankets and 20 army type cots, each equipped with essential accessories. Elsewhere in the ward are supplies needed for treatment, such as stethoscopes, blood pressure apparatus, and devices to permit transfusions and other life-saving steps. A professional nurse supervises available helpers as they administer treatment elevating the foot ends of cots, checking blood pressures and pulses, applying burn dressings and splints. In the receiving room in the foyer, this patient is found in immediate need of surgery and is taken to one of the operating rooms. Note the portable equipment in the operating room, the folding operating table, field type surgical lights, transfusion stand, and other equipment. Instruments are drawn from the central supply room. Here, with a professional nurse in charge, dressings, bandages, syringes, thermometers, and other supplies are being dispensed. Meanwhile, in the sterilizing area of central supply, surgical instruments, rubber gloves, dressings, and gowns are being sterilized. The strange looking sterilizer is actually a large home type pressure cooker. To provide a constant supply of sterile dressings, there are nine of the pressure cooker type sterilizers and others of the boiling type, fired by gasoline or bottled gas. By now, the wards of the emergency hospital are filled. For this patient, a series of laboratory tests is necessary. Out of a chest and two small boxes has come the compact clinical laboratory. The engineers have supplied the hospital with drinking water. This water becomes usable for technical and laboratory purposes when filtered through the medium of a standard chemical water purifying process. As a positive check on fractures and dislocations, and to locate foreign bodies, X-ray examinations and consultations are required. Here is an X-ray apparatus developed for use in emergency situations. It has its own generator. Within a matter of moments, X-ray studies are available. A new fast process eliminates the need for dark rooms or developing solutions. Elsewhere in the hospital, Supplies are being drawn from the pharmacy, stocked with items needed in the emergency period. Sedatives, antibiotics, insulin, tetanus toxoid, anesthetics, among other items. Soon, replenishment units will come in from emergency stocks in state and federal warehouses. Under disaster conditions, all medical personnel will be needed for strictly medical and surgical care. Therefore, in recruitment of prospective personnel and planning for mass medical care, call freely upon other civil defense services for the mass feeding know-how. If the building has no usable kitchen facilities, alternates must be provided, either gas stoves converted for bottled gas or improvised outdoor stoves and ovens. These facilities, these actions, add up to the story of the 200-bed emergency hospital, the answer to hometown's need for medical care for all people needing it in time of serious disaster. 
in such an emergency as this our nation's need for a quick and practical means of augmenting our hospital bed capacity can be met through the emergency hospital today such hospitals are stored at key points and pre positioned to help meet the needs of major industrial and population centers in the event of enemy attack. You can help prepare for such an emergency by working with your local civil defense organization in checking on the needs of your community. Then you will know how many emergency hospitals your community needs. In addition, you can help recruit and train necessary auxiliary personnel to man those hospitals. 